the report card with Nat Malkus. This is a special HEA edition of the report card because yesterday, Senator Lamar Alexander, chairman of the Senate Help Committee, came to AEI to lay out his vision for the Higher Education Act reauthorization, which he's trying to get through this year. The federal government spends more than $100 billion on financial aid for college students. But if you look in the news, you're going to see stories about high tuition prices, students with too much debt, and a lot of students that aren't completing college. Increasingly, both parties recognize we need higher ed reform. And the Higher Education Act is the federal law that governs financial aid and the rest of federal oversight over post-secondary education. It was supposed to be reauthorized way back in 2013, but Congress hasn't been able to do it yet. The question is, is it this year? Well, today, Lamar Alexander laid out what he thought HEA should include, and I have two guests, AEI's very own Jason Delisle and Lene Erickson, Senior Vice President for the Social Policy and Politics Program at Third Way. Jason and Lene, welcome to the podcast. So, Jason, I'm going to kick it off to you. You got a chance to see the remarks ahead of time and sort of know what's coming. Can you give us a little bit of a summary? What did he lay out for us? The Higher Education Act, which, you know, contains all the federal government student aid programs, grants and loans and rules about them, expires every once in a while. And Congress needs to reauthorize. So these are the words you're going to hear about. So reauthorizing the Higher Education Act. And it's really an opportunity for Congress to do many of the things that might not rise to the level of doing on a sort of an emergency or, or on, a, on an appropriations bill or some, something like that. But it also allows lawmakers to think more holistically. And so I think that's what you saw Senator Alexander trying to do here is pull the whole thing together. Many different proposals. He listed many different proposals in the Senate among his colleagues that he likes that would sort of reset and redo the higher education programs that the federal government already has in place. Yeah. And and Chairman Alexander, a Republican, listed a bunch of bills from, you know, sort of narrower, smaller bills. And so you're saying HEA is a chance to bring them over. A lot of those bills were bipartisan, most of them. And so this is sort of like the big bill that can go through that we can attach a holistic vision. That's what we're talking? Yeah. And as I saw him sort of piece these things together, what I really noticed was some themes, right? One big theme here is simplification. And it runs through many of the things that he's proposed, where he's talking about the form that you fill out to apply for federal student aid, asks a lot of questions about your income and your assets. He's been trying for years to get that down to fewer questions to simplify it. And also student loan repayment. There are a lot of different options borrowers have to repay their loans. He wants to get it down to two. So again, a lot of sort of simplification themes running through his agenda that he's laying out. But we don't have a lot of specifics yet either. I'll just, I should say that before we like start getting into this probably hear us talk about, well, if he means this or does he mean that, right? We still don't actually have a bill yet. Yeah, there are some big, broad points. And when you talk about simplification, Lene, can we get behind this? I saw him again. I think he carries that long FAFSA. So for those of you who couldn't catch it, he carries a long FAFSA, a paper form. You know, it's all folded over on itself and it's about eight pages long and he lets it drop to the floor. It's he a almost, very effective device. Yeah, he almost tripped on it, actually. <laughs> and I thought that... He brought uh, his own hazard. Yeah, that actually, in fact, would have been a great opportunity because, you know, if it had been 28 questions like he wanted to be, he probably probably would have avoided the fall. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, and I think Democrats want him to avoid tripping on the FAFSA, too. So that's good. But, you know, if you step back a little bit and set the context for the political scene, you have a chairman who cares deeply about higher education. He used to be a president of a university has been a leader in education for a long time. Former Secretary um, of Education. Former Secretary yeah. of Education, who has a lot of viewpoints on this stuff, but it's also his last time that he gets to really weigh in. This Congress is going to be his last, and he really wants to get some stuff across the finish line. So, as Jason said, FAFSA has been his obsession for a long time, simplifying it, and he knows he's coming into a Congress where the Democrats in the House aren't going to agree to a full-scale rewrite of a lot of things that he might want. And so he's trying to find some things that already have bipartisan support that he can kind of staple together and make a bigger bill. Now, I think that that's a real missed opportunity because I actually think higher education is less fraught with partisan politics than a lot of other issues. And as he pointed out, the things that are fraught, like free college, are really more about appropriations than about authorization. They're about giving more money or less money. So 
we could have a much more robust discussion about how we could actually better target our higher education system to get better outcomes for students. So I'm hoping that this is just an opening salvo that then leads to a broader conversation about not just the three bills and change that he put on the table. Today. So let's let's talk about that in terms of low hanging fruit. And I realize that just thinking about the low hanging fruit is not necessarily wise. But what is the low hanging fruit that he talked about, where he's probably going to get bipartisan support that actually can be something that we can build on both sides of the aisle? Well, I think there were three things that he mentioned in particular that are things in the abstract Democrats want. Simplifying the FAFSA form so that more people who are low income can get access to the grants and loans that they are eligible for. Allowing people to repay their loans in a more streamlined way, as Jason talked about. And then his third prong was this idea of an accountability system that would make sure a college or a program is equipping students to repay their loans. So we know that some of the guardrails that the federal government's put in place right now aren't really working, and that was his kind of proposal to put on the table. None of those are non-starters for Democrats, but I think the idea of just doing those things is a non-starter for Democrats because they really want to address the broader issues of affordability and accountability within higher ed, and it's not just like simplifying the FAFSA is a simple thing that actually really deeply affects eligibility for which students get access to funds. So this isn't a bite-sized piece you can just break off and, and put it you know, to the side. I think of it very similar to the work I do on immigration policy, where a lot of people might really think we should fix the H-1B system, but we're not going to get a fix to the H-1B system unless we have a broader conversation about, I don't know, border security and undocumented people and future flow and all these other things. And here, I think he is trying to break off pieces, but they're not as small as you might think. So he talked about some pretty big changes as far as repayment. Can you summarize those quick, Jason? Yeah. So for repaying student loans, he says, I want there to be two plans. Currently, there's nine. I mean, kind of. So he wants it to, he Re- wants it to reportedly. be... Reportedly. Yeah, reportedly. Most people would never really encounter them in, in that kind of way. But he wants it an income-based repayment plan, which we already have. Right? That's one option. The other option is fixed payments over 10 years based okay, on the amount so of So both of these, and just to reiterate this for the audience, an income-based repayment plan is a repayment plan that is based on your income. And it just makes sure that you're only spending 10% of your discretionary income. So if you're not making any money, you're not getting crushed by student loan debt. Yeah. And that was what was interesting is he's talking about the plan that President Obama proposed and saw enacted. And that's what he's sort of touting, which yeah, I think is interesting. And then he's saying, let's have that and let's have a plan, a 10-year fixed payment. Now, here's what's sort of interesting. We were talking about bipartisan themes here. If you go over into the House and you look at what the Democrats are proposing on, on the committee, you can see that they want to do the same thing. Two plans, income-based repayment and a fixed you know, mortgage-style payment over a term. I mean, that's interesting right there that, right. that everybody seems that that's what they want to do. I'll actually say, I'll give a shout out to the Democrats. I actually like their fixed payment schedule better because they're saying, the more you borrow, if you have higher debts, we we'll give you a longer term automatically. But Senator Alexander, but that's complicated, right? There's some complexity. It's not choices, it's automatic. But what Senator Alexander is saying is it's income based or 10 year. His is actually simpler. There are just fewer options. And it is much simpler, but it may be a bit too simple by half, maybe too simple by half. For instance, he's saying, you know, Will, you don't have to write a check. You're not going to get a statement. We're going to do this through the tax system. That sounds fairly easy, right? (sighs) Yeah, no, I don't think so. I've looked at this for many years. I see the promise in doing it. All else being equal, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of doing it. I think that the problem is we don't want to oversell it. I don't think it can be automatic. I really don't think you can make this automatic. I mean, if you think about it, like think about when you go to a new job and they hand you a bunch of forms. And one of these forms is called, what, what is it, a W-4? W-4. Okay, so, so what are you doing right there, right? You are actually telling your employer how much to withhold. So even our tax system is not automatic. You got to tell them how much to take out of your paycheck, <laughs> right? So if you even by making it just like taxes, it's still not automatic. What I would like to see the senator do in this kind of thing is, is sort of just be honest with people on what this is going to be. Don't overpromise and say there's a better way to do this. There's going to be, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I think on net it's going to be better. Well, you know, I think Alexander just wants to trim the FAFSA. 
and triple the length of the W four, and you know we're sort of balanced <laughs> out, right? Yeah. It's all. It's not that bad. Uh, that's why. That's why you didn't interview him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he wants to simplify the FAFSA. He wants to change the repayment system. He's got one more big leg, and that is gainful for all. Is that what they called it? Yeah, so you heard this, gainful for all. All right, tell us what gainful, yeah, so uh, the gainful, gainful Well, Lene, Lene's totally up to speed. Okay, so Lene, for the audience who may not be familiar, what is gainful for all, gainful employment rule? So gainful employment is a phrase that is in the statute of the Higher Education Act, and it applies to career programs. So if you're signing up for a program that's supposed to get you into a job, it says that we're only going to fund federal tax dollars for you to go to that program if it actually would result in you being gainfully employed makes sense. But the Obama administration said, let's define what that means. And for them, it meant let's compare the debt that you would get in that program to the earnings that you would get if you graduate that program. Now, it only applies to career programs and to for-profit programs. And so a lot of folks took it as a hit on the for-profit industry. Now there's been a lot of backlash. And so some folks who didn't like the specificity of it said, well, if you're going to hold some institutions and programs accountable, you should do it for all okay, of them. Okay. So that's, that's the game gainful for, for all. some. And now he's talking about gainful for all. And how is he planning on doing this one? Well, his proposal is that you actually look at repayment rates, loan repayment, okay. whether a student can repay a loan from a program, because you're thinking, well, if they can repay that loan, then they probably can make enough money and that should be sufficient. And also the loan is really what the taxpayer should be concerned about because we want it to be paid back. So that's the federal nexus to care about this in the first place. But the combination of doing that with these kinds of programs that we've talked about that put you into income-based repayment means lots and lots of people are going to be, quote unquote, repaying their loans, even if they're paying zero dollars oh, on their right. loans. So, it, so, so this could have worked. If you put it together, worked. it might be not so much accountability right. as you might So think. it could have worked under the old system, but when you change two things, your new system doesn't work. Well, right? not necessarily. The current system says if, if people default, they go a long time without making any payment. We don't know their income. We don't know their situation. We just know they don't pay. And if you have too many of those students at your school, the whole school loses eligibility. And so, and then gainful employment, the rule, which Lene described, doesn't have anything to do with repaying your loan exactly. It is a debt to an income ratio with this sort of implicit argument that you would not be able to pay. You might, but it's just too burdensome, right? So what I heard Senator Alexander say in this speech was that he wants to replace this first rule, this cohort default rate rule, right. with a loan repayment rule, which is, are borrowers reducing the principal balance on their loans over a certain period of time? And you can do that even with income-based repayment. It's just, where do you set the cut? These are the details. Like, where do you set the cut? Should 80% of your students be able to pay down some of the principal within five years? You know, what's a, where are you, you going to put it? Those are the big questions in this. Those are the big details that I think matter. So that's well, the devil in the details. That's the devil the in the The devil's details. certainly in the details, but I think, boy, would I wish we could get to an 80% repayment rate because the thing that Democrats and Republicans have now agreed on is we're going to have a very generous system of income-based repayment. So most students aren't actually repaying a dollar on their principal in the first five years. Now, we don't have all of the data to know that, and I wish that we could model every single program, but it does complicate it because we've said, if you're not making enough money, then you don't have to pay your loans. Well, that means a lot of people aren't actually paying more than their interest that's occurring. Their balance is growing. You know, under the current system, they might get those loans forgiven later, but it's not actually going to sync well with using this repayment measure if we continue kind of down the current path. But as far as in the secretary's defense, it seems like there is some measure where schools would have some skin in the game here to say, OK, well, this program is not producing enough income vis-a-vis -vis the debt that kids get so that, you know, that's the old gainful rule. The new one is that we're just not paying it off, whatever. The point being that it would put pressure on schools to kind of bring down the costs and not just in a broad way, but in a targeted way. Is that going to work? 
Well, I think it's a great concept, and I think that HEA should have a lot of those kinds of measures in it because what we've seen right now is that we're spending $130 billion a year to hand to institutions and asking them for absolutely nothing in return in terms of what students are getting. So I would say, yeah, let's measure something like repayment. Let's also measure their debt. Let's also measure their earnings. Let's also measure whether or not they've gotten a degree. We're funding lots of institutions where you are more likely to default on your loans than you are to graduate. And that, to me, seems like a waste for both the taxpayers and the students. I mean, it's interesting that you want us to change the way we do this accountability system from the default rate to are you paying down principal? It's actually getting closer. What I think to what we want to measure is how much you're earning. I think where these kinds of proposals are sort of wide of the mark is that they are focused on the debt because we now have the means to just measure earnings directly. Well, why are we just doing that? Because, if really, well, it should be, you know, you should earn enough to, to make it worth it. Okay, well, where is that in the equation for any of these plans? And where's the taxpayer's investment in the equation? Because for a lot of these students, they're getting Pell Grants, which is $30 billion a year. That's coming out of my pocket and going to a very worthy cause of getting low-income students through school, but only if they're getting a degree and able to, to pay it back. And so taking into account more than just loans, but the huge amount of money we're spending on Pell is super important, especially if you're going to really test whether schools are serving low-income students. Right. So the, the quality question here applies to both payers, and that is loan payers on the one hand, but also to the federal government who's giving Pell Grants a lot of money, and a lot of those dollars are going to students that aren't getting degrees. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a poor spend on both sides. You were right, Nat, and you said, okay, well, this would encourage colleges to push the prices down with it. And another, I should say, one thing we're talking about here is an interesting development that many people might miss is that Senator Alexander wants to do this by the program level at the institution. Explain that. What is Yeah. So there was some talk of this on the, on the panel. And so traditionally, federal rules on quality assurance have cared only about a whole institution of higher education. They look at the whole thing. Look at We roll up all their numbers, and that's what you're looking at. So the University of Maryland. The University of Maryland okay. is a whole big thing, right? We just care about their one the number. Earth. And this is something that the Obama administration started with their gainful employment rule. They say, no, 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 let's go down to the program level so they can't hide behind averages. Sarah Flanagan from the Private Colleges Association say is that that is a sort of paperwork nightmare for them. That's a very real concern. You know, I don't know if it rises to the level of saying, well, let's just not do it, but it's a real concern. I mean, th these are, there are lots of different programs. Sarah talked a little bit about the potential for gaming. We can just move students into this program versus that program. We can keep the programs below the privacy levels, right? Another thing that we talk about might encourage them to keep their prices low, but it also will definitely encourage them to be more selective in who they enroll. It absolutely will do that. I actually think that that will sort of be the deal breaker for the Democrats. I think there's a lot of promise to thinking about different levels at which we can have quality assurance. What I worry about when it's just institution level, like it is right now, is that members of Congress are risk averse. They're very, very tied to the higher education industry. And so the kinds of accountability we have right now, we don't actually use them. Someone will step in and say, I know that you have all these students defaulting, but I really like this school. It was my alma mater or it's in my neighborhood. And so I'm going to save it, which is what happened to a community college in San Francisco because Nancy Pelosi decided that that was her neighborhood school, even though everybody agreed it wasn't serving students well. So I think the other benefit to thinking about different levels is maybe there's some graduated sanctions you can have. Instead of saying, we're going to shut down this school by taking away all of Title IV access, you can say, mm, that program's not great. You have to shut that one down. Does that mean you have to be more responsive to student needs and employer needs and things like that? We don't know how that'll all play out, but I think there is something interesting to think about there because ultimately all of these members of Congress have institutions in their backyards and they're there to protect them. Yeah. And I can hear a lot of people saying, oh, that sounds like federal micromanagement right off the bat. <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to say one thing that Sarah Flanagan mentioned that I thought was really interesting, the idea of let's look at the program level. Well, maybe we'll charge different amounts for different programs. If one just gives higher income, it makes sense to pay more for it. And she said, yeah, but then you run into this, the shoals of equity, right? Because then your, your poor students are more likely to say, well, I'm going to go for the bargain degree. And then they're going to miss out on the returns to that degree. And so if your setup works that way, you can actually have tracking. Does that sound right? 
Well, I don't think that the marketplace actually works that effectively right now. I mean, that assumes that students are actually making those choices based on the price of the program and looking at the data, which we don't really have great access to, and that schools are then being responsive to those students. None of those things are happening right now. So <laughs> maybe we could get down a line where federal accountability is driving people towards different prices for different things. But if you're only going to earn, you know, $22,000 a year out of coming out of a certificate program, you shouldn't be paying $50,000 a year for it. So I think there is already graduation in our system, and there's already a lot of different things that are going on that are pushing students to choose things yeah. that aren't just about price. And we need to tackle some of those before we worry that, oh, now we're going to track everybody into one thing or the other. Right. One thing that Senator Alexander mentioned was short-term Pell. So this, everybody likes this idea on both sides of the aisle because everyone loves workforce. So, so what's short-term? Let's make Pell grants actually be able to go to shorter-term programs that are more workforce-based. And what's the limit right now? They go to more than a traditional bachelor's That's degree. Right. So I don't actually know what the limit is right now, okay. do you? Nope, I was hoping you did. I uh, certainly don't. But, but this is something like shorter than even a, like, than like six months. Right. We're talking about eight-week programs for coding camps or something like that, right? And the idea is, oh, then more people get directly into the workforce. Well, if you don't put any kind of backstop on that or guardrails for quality, you're going to have huge for profit saying, hey, you know, it's really cheap. I'm going to do an eight week coding class cheap on my end. I'm going to charge a lot of money to these students. And then all of a sudden, you know, I have a new way of bringing in income. That actually would be a really smart thing for them to do if we open up something like short term Pell. So I think you have to think about these kind of bipartisan proposals that might have some support on both sides of the aisle because they're politically popular from a little bit of a deeper lens of what are we actually incentivizing in our in our system. Okay, so let's run this out with a couple of minutes on what's not in Alexander's comments. Like, what yeah. should have been in there that didn't make the cut? I didn't see anything on what we're going to do with this issue of the outrageously generous loan forgiveness programs for people who go to graduate school. So you can borrow an unlimited amount. Right now, he did mention this, that you can borrow an unlimited amount to go to graduate school and get the same repayment terms as the undergraduates he's talking about and have a lot of loans forgiven after 20 years. He doesn't mention anything about that so far in his proposal. He just talked about undergraduates. In the questions, I asked him about this. He said, well, yeah, I think there's some interest in dealing with that, but didn't make his speech, sure. which I think is an interesting point. Another but, thing but there's is, a question of whether that's a political calculation for right now at this waypoint towards HEA and whether he really doesn't want to tackle that. Yeah, but some of the bills that he talked about, so the Burr King student loan reform bill does address the graduate school loan forgiveness bonanza. And that was one of the bills he cited as a great idea. So maybe there's still an opportunity there. Another thing is unlimited loans for parents, this parent plus loan program, which the Wall Street Journal just had a big article on this past weekend. Parents can borrow unlimited amounts, full cost of attendance, and there is no ability to repay check. In fact, the crazy part is that you have to fill out a FAFSA. This is the forum we started talking about. You give all these detailed information about your income and your assets, and the federal government determines that they're zero, and then it automatically clears you for an unlimited loan. I mean, it's insane. Huh. No plan, from what I can tell, to tackle that. Okay. I've yeah. never heard you talk about this. <laughs> yeah. Lene? Well, the reason it's great that Jason keeps bringing it up is no one does want to talk about it because those are hard problems, and they're particularly hard problems politically. Yeah. Neither Democrats or Republicans want to raise their hand and say, let's tackle Parent Plus or let's tackle grad loans. I wish they would in general, but they're very difficult problems. One thing that people do like to talk about that I heard very little about from Senator Alexander was affordability. And I do think there's going to need to be more of a discussion of money and investment if you're going to get Democrats on board for anything on higher education. One of the audience members asked about the maintenance of effort provisions in other laws that says you can't take some federal money and then just stop putting your own money into it if you're a state. Right. Higher education doesn't have that. And what we've seen is that states are just disinvesting, disinvesting, disinvesting because they have to balance their budgets. And when they have maintenance of effort on everything else, they have to keep those things going. They take it from higher ed. And that's a huge problem that we, I think, are going to need to tackle in this HEA. We've done a series of papers with AEI on ideas around focusing on completion and improving those completion rates because the most likely person to default is the person who took out loans and then didn't get a degree. Right. 
there's a lot of good ideas out there. I didn't hear him talk about any of those. And then finally, I love to talk about accreditation. And I didn't hear any talk about accreditation there, even though, frankly, Secretary DeVos is doing a lot of work on accreditation right now. So I'm just curious if that was on purpose to let them just continue their negotiated rulemaking and handle it over there. If that was just too wonky or too hard to tackle in this bill, I'm not sure. But I think there really needs to be a focus on how do you become a school that gets to have federal money. And if those watchdogs aren't being particularly good at their job, then we're all kind of screwed. What about that completion? I mean, completion is just, to me, the elephant in the room here. Is it because it's just too hard for Congress to affect? Is it because the institutions don't want to be messed with? I mean, where's the rub? Well, I would think, you know, the Rick Hess perspective at AEI when we did these series of papers was that you could get very quickly to federal overreach. So a lot of us who work on higher ed also worked on K-12, and people have these visions of no child left behind for higher ed, and we don't want to go there. I think that we are so far away from that that we don't need to be so worried about that right now. We should really think about taking some measures, at least, in the paper series that we did. There were several academics that pointed out some really, really tangible things that we could do and fund and incentivize schools to do that would raise completion rates. So I hope that Congress is willing to take a look at that. We'll see. We've got the bill going to conference in the spring, <laughs> going to the House in the fall. Yeah, let and me, it's going to be another Christmas miracle just like us. Well, well, let me just add one thing I asked Senator Alexander. Is I said, are you envisioning just big increase in spending in this bill on higher ed? Or is this budget neutral? What are you aiming for? And he said, oh, budget neutral. If you go and you look at Congressman Bobby Scott's bill. He's the chairman of the education committee. We don't have an estimate yet of what it costs, but I have gone through it a couple of times. I mean, it's going to be 50, 60 billion a year in new spending. And so, I mean, zero versus 56 billion a year is quite a gap to close. (laughs) Right? So that's a major issue. Well, and there are some places that you could take the money from, but a lot of those places have very, very highly paid lobbyists that'll make sure you don't do it. Well, We'll figure it out by this summer, I'm sure. Lene, Jason, thanks for coming on the report card. Anytime. Thanks for listening to this special HEA edition of the report card with Nat Malkus. We'd like to thank Senator Alexander for coming to AEI and giving his keynote on his vision for HEA. And of course, special thanks to our guests, Jason Delisle and Lene Erickson for talking about it. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our fantastic team of producers. That includes Sophia Gallo, Cody Christensen, Macy Heath and Gage Hurley. Remember, if you like this episode, search for us, The Report Card, on Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast player is. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to rate or review us on iTunes or Google. If you have any comments, questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, you can reach us at ed.podcast at AEI.org. And until next time, I'm Nat Malkus. Malchus.